One of my favorite publications is a small weekly called simply Menace, which I highly recommend. In this issue of June 28, 1972, in its book review section, it recommended The Educated Imagination, a book of lectures given some years ago for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation by Northrop Frye, which I subsequently ordered and read and also recommend. Northrop Frye speaks of three uses of language. Now, the first has to do with simple awareness of the facts of life and is made up mostly of nouns and adjectives. This language provides an inventory of what's out there. Its concern is with what is. Then there's the practical language of what one must do to get along in the world, how to relate to the environment. And in its most developed form, this is the language of science. Finally, there's the language of what might be, the language of what we're able to imagine could be. Now, all forms of language use the power of imagination, but only the third includes the major works of the imagination. In its other uses, imagination is more of a practical tool, not the designing architect of the creative intelligence. Now, Fry's book is concerned with the importance of having an educated imagination. By an imagination, schooled through conscious practice, the reach of the mind is extended beyond all ordinary limits. Now, let me repeat that. By an imagination schooled through conscious practice, the reach of the mind is extended beyond all ordinary limits. To Matthew Arnold, Fry recalls, distinguished between the environment and what he termed culture. The environment is what is, call it the status quo, or from another viewpoint, the establishment. But culture is made up of the vision of men, the best that has been thought and said. An environment without a horizon of culture would soon be fatal to human beings. But while we have obvious need to know how to relate to what is, never to imagine going beyond it would dehumanize us. Of the day-to-day -day level of what is, Fry says, On this level we use words to say the right thing at the right time, to keep the social machinery running, faces saved, self-respect preserved, and social situations intact. It's not the noblest thing that words can do, but it's essential, and it creates and diffuses a social mythology, which is a structure of words developed by the imagination. But we find that, to use words properly, even in this way, we have to use our imaginations, otherwise they become mechanical clichés and get further and further removed from any kind of reality. There's something in all of us, and I think this is important, there's something in all of us that wants to drift toward a mob where we can all say the same thing without having to think about it, because everybody is all alike except people that we hate or persecute. Every time we use words, we're either fighting against this tendency or giving into it. Now, when we fight against it, we're taking the side of genuine and permanent civilization. The power of the imagination is the means by which resistance to this retrograde tendency is strengthened. If the imagination is not made to flow into disciplined channels, avenues defined by vision, then its uses are degraded to unworthy, even if apparently spectacular purposes. As Fry puts it, The civilization we live in at present is a gigantic technological structure, a skyscraper almost high enough to reach the moon. It looks like a single worldwide effort, but it's really a deadlock of rivalries. It looks very impressive, except that it has no genuine human dignity. For all of its wonderful machinery, we know it's really a crazy ramshackle building, and at any time may crash around our ears. Now, what the myth tells us is that the Tower of Babel is a work of the human imagination, that its main elements are words, and that what will make it collapse is a confusion of tongues. All had originally one language, the myth says. That language is not English or Russian or Chinese or any common ancestor, if there was one. It's the language of human nature, the language that makes both Shakespeare and Pushkin authentic poets, that gives a social vision to both Lincoln and Gandhi. It never speaks unless we take the time to listen in leisure, and it speaks only in a voice too quiet for panic to hear. And then, all it has to tell us when we look over the edge of our leaning tower is that we're not getting any nearer heaven, and that it's time to return to earth. Let's pick out the main points of that tremendously important and original theme. First, there are three languages. The first has to do with simple awareness of the facts of life and is made up mostly of nouns and adjectives. This language provides an inventory of what is out there. Its concern is with what is. Then secondly, there's the language, the practical language of what one must do to get along in the world, how to relate to the environment. And in its most developed form, this is the language of science. It's the language of our work. And on this level, we use words to say the right thing at the right time, to keep the social machinery running, faces saved, self-respect preserved, and social situations intact. It's not the noblest thing that words can do, but it's essential. 
Hello there, good morning, how are you feeling? Great, me too. Rotten weather, isn't it? Right. Well, there's something in us all that wants to drift toward a mob where we can all say the same thing without having to think about it, because everybody is all alike except people that we can hate or persecute, and every time we use words, we're either fighting against this tendency or giving into it. And when we fight against it, we're taking the side of genuine and permanent civilization. I have a saying framed in my office that reads, Never, for the sake of peace and quiet, deny your own experience or convictions. It was written by Dag Hammarskjöld, late Secretary General of the United Nations. The easy thing is to go along with the gang, laugh at their jokes, and agree with their prejudices, just be a good old boy, a girl, one of the gang. It's the easiest way on earth to never amount to much. And kid yourself into believing that at least you're doing as well as the other fellows. People who have never taken the hard road to self-discovery, lacking an identity of their own, find comfort in losing themselves within the larger identity of the group. This is the person who says, in effect, I don't know who I am or where I'm going, but at least I'm a member of good old such-and-such organization. Yes, sir. As Manus puts it, the power of the imagination is the means by which resistance to this retrograde tendency is strengthened. If the imagination is not made to flow into disciplined channels, avenues defined by vision, then its uses are degraded to unworthy, even if apparently spectacular purposes. For the third language is the language of what might be, the language of what we're able to imagine could be. It's the language of hope. It's the language with which we formulate worthy goals and ideals. It's the designing architect of the creative intelligence. It's the universal language which speaks to all of us during those moments when we reach unusual peaks of human aspiration and genius. As Fry puts it, that language is not English or Russian or Chinese or any common ancestor if there was one. It's the language of human nature, the language that makes both Shakespeare and Pushkin authentic poets, that gives a social vision to both Lincoln and Gandhi. It never speaks unless we take the time to listen in leisure. And it speaks only in a voice too quiet for panic to hear. And then, all it has to tell us, when we look over the edge of our leaning tower, is that we're not getting any nearer heaven, and that it's time to return to earth. Time to return to earth. Now I'll buy that, and I think you will too. It's time to tear away the phony tinsel and chrome and junk and cheap plastic from our lives and find the big moving, pulsing life that has been so sickly or hidden away in the hold while most of so-called civilized humanity has been on a silly pleasure cruise to nowhere. Yes, I think it's time we return to Earth. As far as the man-created problems, the same technology that created them can overcome and do away with them when it's finally coordinated on a worldwide basis. It should start in America because Americans are the world's champion polluters. And it has started here with remarkable results. You know, I found more eye-burning and irritating smog in the city of Johannesburg, South Africa, than I've ever experienced in Los Angeles. And it's the same in Tokyo, London, Paris, and Rome. The west coast of Italy is a cesspool, and no more birds can be found near the harbor at Genoa. And they've been living on that coast for thousands of years. We're the world champion polluters of the air and water because of our highly developed and sophisticated technology. But I have no doubt whatever that the same technology will make the North American continent the cleanest on Earth within 50 years. We are returning to Earth. We're realizing that just as the mind and body are inseparable and interacting agencies, so are the Earth and man. And the industries that clean up America can also clean up the world and give us new and serendipitous industries as great as any we have known in the past It could help the balance of payments. But now, how about you and me and our families? Can we listen to that third language, the language that never speaks unless we take the time to listen in leisure, the voice that speaks too softly for panic to hear, and when we listen to it, all it has to tell us when we look over the edge of our leaning tower is that we're not getting any nearer heaven and that it's time to return to earth. I'm certain that Mr. Fry uses the word heaven here in its metaphorical sense, that we're not getting any nearer to the kind of world a creature with the brains and ingenuity of man should be able to create for himself. Someone said, man can swim faster and deeper than the fish, he can fly faster and higher than the birds, he can tunnel deeper and with more efficiency into the earth than can any burrowing creature. The only thing he hasn't learned how to do is walk on the earth like a man. But by an imagination schooled through conscious practice, the reach of the mind is extended beyond all ordinary limits. Now this tells us that with practice, 
the reach of our imagination, the reach of our minds, can be extended beyond all ordinary limits. It's true. And as we've said before, imagination is everything. So let's return to Earth through the exercise of an expanded imagination. What's important to you? What, and forget all about language number two here, the language that says the so-called right thing at the right time, faith is saved, self-respect preserved, and social situations intact, what's the most important thing in the world to you, really? Not what the community expects from you or your neighbors or your family, but what's important to you? What has that quiet voice been saying to you when you've taken the time and leisure to listen to it? Hasn't it been something that you know down deep in the very fibers of your being is true, true for you? Then remember what Thoreau said. You have only to move in the direction of your dreams to meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Emerson told us to trust that voice within, to trust our own intelligence and that small, still voice that tries so hard to get us on the right track and which we so often fight to maintain the status quo, the dreary lives of what Thoreau called a quiet desperation. The chances are that what the voice is trying to tell you to do is also best for everyone concerned, the community, your family, everyone in the long run. So then, through the systematic exercise of our imaginations, let's return to Earth, our Earth, that place that is right for us, and that will bring us the joy and fulfillment we seek. Think. Relax. Become as serene as you can and listen to the voice, the voice that never speaks unless we listen in leisure. Gradually, through a little daily exercise with practice, the reach of our minds can be extended beyond all ordinary limits. We will be able to see through the obvious to the truth beyond the truth for us. Now let's go back to something I said earlier. For while we have an obvious need to know how to relate to what is, never to imagine going beyond it, would dehumanize us. Now, in my opinion, only an infinitesimal fraction of humanity uses the most amazing and perhaps least understood human faculty, the one which enables us to bring about through the educated use of the imagination a new and better life, the achievement of new, interesting, exciting goals. And it's when we learn to use this faculty, this seeming miracle of creation, that we become fully alive, fully human. Now, it's here that the imagination is made to flow into disciplined channels, avenues defined by vision. When we throw an electrical switch, we expect things to happen. The lights to go on or off, the motor surges to humming life. We take electricity for granted. It's there, it works. The fact that no one knows what electricity is doesn't bother anyone any more than the fact that our heart will pump in response to an electrical synapse 103,680 times a day, some 38 million times a year for 80 years or so. It's all a complete and total mystery. There's not a single human being alive who understands one blessed thing about it. Sometime in the middle of the fourth month of gestation, a quiet little heart begins suddenly to beat. No one knows how or why. It is a total mystery, period. That there is a connection between all living substances has been demonstrated. A polygraph expert, one who is skilled in the use of the so-called lie detector, has demonstrated that houseplants know when you decide to come home from a shopping trip and react in their own emotional way to that fact. When you dump live brine shrimp into boiling water, they seem to faint before they hit the water that will kill them. And at the same instant, the plants throughout the house react violently to the murder being committed in the kitchen. Now, all of this is a rather circuitous way of saying that there's much that we do not understand. That's an understatement that may well win first prize for the century. What we do know, compared to what we do not know, was cleverly demonstrated by the distinguished inventor and scientist Charles Kettering before an audience of engineers one time. He had a stage backdrop made, which consisted of a great shining sheet of stainless steel, perhaps thirty by fifty feet in size. He took a metal stylus, and going to a corner of the sheet, he made a tiny, almost invisible mark. He then told his audience that the mark he had just made was meant to represent all that science had accomplished to the present time, while the great, pristine, untouched expanse of the sheet of stainless steel was intended to represent what was yet to be discovered. He probably overestimated what we've accomplished. Let's open our minds to the undeniable fact that man is just taking his first shaky, tentative steps into knowledge. You don't need to know what electricity is to read your evening paper or be able to see your way after dark. You don't need to know what keeps your heart beating without your having to think about it for eighty-some years, give or take a few. And now I want you to understand 
that there is a mysterious stuff in which we live, as ubiquitous as the air itself, that responds to the way we habitually think. Now, I don't know what it is. I don't think anybody knows what it is. But it's there, and it works. It's a magic kind of stuff that creates out of itself that which we demand, whether we know we're demanding it or not. It's also the opponent of which Huxley spoke when he compared life to a game of chess. You know, he said our opponent is always fair and just, and would rather we win than lose, but who cannot overlook the smallest mistake or ignorance. He said those who play well are paid with that sort of overflowing generosity with which the strong delight in strength, but those who play ill are checkmated, without haste, but without remorse. A man named Clifford Eccles had dreamed for years of going into business for himself. All his life he'd worked as a clerk in a grocery store for a small salary. One day he ran across a quotation by Emerson that got him off dead center. The quotation was, Do the thing, and you will have the power. But they that do not the thing have not the power. Well, he mortgaged everything he had, arranged for some credit from the necessary suppliers, and a few years later was doing a million dollars a year in business. He said later, As I started to do the thing, the things I'd been thinking and dreaming about... I began to discover that I had hidden talents and abilities I'd never suspected. Ideas came to me that I was able to turn into more successful business. In short, when I had enough faith to start to do the thing, I did find that I had the power. I'd had it all along and hadn't realized it. Well, there's an important lesson there. It's only when we actually begin something that we find we have the power and the talent to carry it off. As long as we sit and think about it, wish for it, and stay where we are, nothing happens. Even Michelangelo said, if people only knew how hard I worked to gain mastery, it wouldn't seem wonderful at all. And perhaps the distinguished Somerset mom put it best when he wrote, It's a funny thing about life. If you refuse to accept anything but the best, you very often get it. We get out of life about what we expect from it, and the endless diversity of expectations is what makes life and its possibilities so interesting. Most people never learn how to play this game of life. Few learn how to play it the way we probably could. If we were really aware of our own powers, we'd live in a continuous state of awe. But most people, those in the big crowd, play the game of life for peanuts when they could be enjoying a banquet. It's too bad, but that's the way it is. The people who never learn how to win at this game of life are those logical, practical, pragmatic people who never jump unless they've got a clear picture of where they're going to land. Play it safe is their motto. And by playing it safe, as they call it, they miss the banquet. Willard F. Rockwell, Jr., the dynamic and brilliant chairman of the board and chief executive officer of the North American Rockwell Corporation, in his excellent book, The Twelve Hats of a Company President, What It Takes to Run a Company, published by Penners Hall, says, The best soothsayer in the world is still guessing. Face it, and train yourself to guess. After you collect all the facts, analyze them rationally, but don't be afraid to add the slightly mysterious ingredient of intuition. Pull up the hood on your toga. When something tells you that an event is going to work out in a certain way, try to figure out what it is that makes you feel that way. Let your intuition take over at times. It may be highly creative whether you entirely understand the process or not. No in a life where death is inevitable. Don't ever play it safe. Play it well. Play it intelligently if you can. Play it courageously and play it for all it's worth. But don't play it safe. We've all got security locked in. It's just down the road. We'll be safe and secure beyond problems and pain forever before too long. To win at chess or golf or tennis or life, you have to make moves. You have to go on the offensive. You have to take chances. There's no way on earth to figure the result of every move in advance. And you're not going to win them all. There's just no way. You've got to lose a little, too. It's the people who won't take the chance of losing who rule out the chance of winning. Sometimes it seems as though the majority of people think it's some kind of a sin to be wrong or to admit that you've been wrong about something or make a mistake. The mature person laughs, admits he was wrong, that he made a bad move or a damn fool mistake, and goes right ahead trying to do better the next time. And if he's wise, he knows about this mysterious stuff, or thinks he knows about it, that over the long haul will give him what he's made up his mind to get. And he knows that sometimes this stuff moves in strange and mysterious ways. He's going to get a hunch to move this way or that way occasionally without knowing why. Call it intuition, a hunch, whatever. And if he's wise, he'll move. He does his best to collect what answers he can in front, but he knows he can't get them all. Life just doesn't reveal the back of the book. We must take our stand and then wait to be rewarded or knocked flat, whichever the case may be. For those who strive for the top, it's important to remember that 
It can be reached just as satisfactorily within a large organization as it can in a business of one's own, often even more so. The chances of a person building anything approaching the size of some of our larger corporations during his own lifetime or pulling down the kind of income he can earn in a large organization are not always very good. It's unlikely that Mr. Wilson could have built another General Motors on his own during his own working lifetime. Nor is it likely that he would have amassed the millions or earned $600,000 a year as an entrepreneur. He did it all as an employee of a large company. Moreover, with the resources that a large company can command, projects can be embarked upon and satisfactions derived that would be difficult or impossible in a smaller organization. In a study to find out what makes those who get to the top so valuable, the Harvard Business School concluded that those who lead are not just problem solvers, they're problem finders. And if you think about the people who have scored big in the business world over the past century, you recognize them as problem finders or identifiers. We tend to take problems for granted and put up with them as part of the world we have to live with. The problem identifier is one who's conscious of problems and isolates them and casts about for a solution, who trains the reach of his imagination. I saw a signboard recently advertising a Suzuki motorcycle. The caption read, It solves the boredom problem, or words to that effect. Now, boredom is a problem with young people today. Here was an advertising agency identifying the problem and offering a solution. We hear people say, Young people are bored today. The problem identifier sees that condition not only as a social problem, but also as a business opportunity. In a study made many years ago by Notre Dame, if my memory serves me correctly, it was discovered that while executives were usually worth their higher salaries, and that they had the ability to solve problems and emerge victorious from crises when they arose, they seldom or never thought creatively between crises. They were reactors to problems, and were typical of people in management generally. They would not run from or turn away from crises or problems. They'd tear right into them with brains and confidence, and like the airline pilot who in 30 seconds will earn his salary for a year by overcoming with skill and courage a hairy problem that suddenly arises, but perhaps much of the rest of the time is content to just sit back and drive. They represent the backbone of the industries they represent, and we'd be out of business without them. But they seldom form the habit of isolating problems that need solving before they develop. Frequently, our worst enemies, when it comes to doing some of the things we might find a great deal of growth and fun doing, are our friends, relatives, even our parents. We seem to know intuitively that there's a big opportunity for a world out there, but parents and relatives, in their desire to protect us from harm, think they're doing us a favor when they tell us to chicken out and take the safer middle road. You have a fertile field for neuroses when a young person knows the world is full of adventure and his parents keep after him to become a CPA. May the powers that be save us from well-meaning friends, relatives, and parents. They have no more reason to prescribe a lifetime career for us than we would have prescribing a career for them. And it often seems that those who have themselves missed the boat and find themselves living small and dreary lives are the quickest to suggest a route for us. Or what is just as bad, blowing our good ideas out of the box when we're naive enough to try them out on them. Emerson wrote something to the effect that no one ever falls ill, but that passers-by do not idly hope that he will die. And something similar could be written about seeking advice from people little qualified to give it. I have a small wooden box on my desk where visitors can see it, and on the top is the word advice. And when you go to open it, you find that it's simply a solid block of wood. It cannot be opened. There is no advice, not today or any day. There is one exception in the advice department. And that's a book you should read by L. Rust Hills, which is interestingly entitled, How to Do Things Right. To quote from the author's introductory note, You'll find all the answers here, no matter what the question that's bothering you, whether it be how to save your marriage, what to do about America's industrial growth, how you can be absolutely certain your alarm will go off in the morning, or how to counteract the chaos and immorality of modern life. The book is wonderfully funny, but there's also much meat in it. Let me quote briefly from pages 25 and 26 on the importance of order in our lives. What I mean by order, he writes, when I'm being serious, is not neatness and tidiness and cleanliness, not the every chair in place, polished ashtrays, never an open book left lying in the so-called but misnamed living rooms of upper-middle-class suburbs of medium-sized Midwestern cities. There's no beauty there, no life either. Everyone's down in the cellar in the pseudo-pine-paneled, also misnamed playroom watching TV. What I do mean by order is not taking on more than you can manage without still being able to do what you really want. What order is is not purchasing a lot more stuff than you can fairly easily pay for, not because debts are bad as such, but because they end up worrying you 
and because you don't really need the stuff anyway, and you have to maintain it and lug it around with you and get it fixed when it breaks. Order is the opposite of complicating. It's simplifying. Order is not getting deeply entangled with another woman so you don't get her problems on top of your own. Order is like not wasting a lot of time trying to find things. Order is avoiding a lot of recriminations because you didn't do something you said you would, and maybe it's not saying you'll do a lot of things to begin with. Order is scrupulousness and meticulousness in arrangements with others, so neither of you is disappointed. It's doing things right or fairly right. It's establishing so far as possible a sense of a regular, regulated, ongoing household, so the family can come and go in freedom, knowing there's definitely a place to come back to and what it'll be like when they get there, get home. Order is not having to worry too much that you've forgotten something again. Basically, what order is, is not getting in over your head. Order is definitely not things like regimentation and repression. Order is freedom, or at least freeing. One last time. Order is not an aspect of compulsion, but of tranquility. The tranquility that permits you to do what you really want. The trouble is that disorder in our lives accumulates so gradually that by the time it bugs us, it seems too late to do anything about it, and we're not sure we want to anyway. This is especially so in our married lives, but it's true of other aspects too, our business and general busyness. The growing complexity seems a natural part of growing older and assuming responsibility. Children, promotions, possessions are in fact all very much wanted when they arrive. A lot of the things we own, the extra car, the summer house, the children's TV, are acquired in the delusion that they will make things better, and especially ironic, easier. They ultimately do not, of course, because most of these conveniences, so-called, do not simplify, but further complicate. Disappointment leads to dissatisfaction, which leads to disillusionment, which leads to something quite like desperation and despair, and it all gets to be too much. One is in over one's head and simply must get out. I suggest you add How to Do Things Right to your library. You'll enjoy the book immensely. It'll have you and your spouse laughing together, but it also makes a lot of sense. The author, L. Russ Tills, makes the extremely perspicacious point that people get divorced for, of all things, companionship. And he's right. The person wants a divorce, he or she says, because he or she wants to simplify his or her life. One of the curious things about the English language is that there's no word for both male and female. And once you get into that he or she business, things can get ridiculous. If you just say he, as we were taught to do when we wanted to include both sexes, the women's rib people jump all over you. And speaking of divorce, in a recent radio program, I quoted the following statistics. For every 1,000 new marriages in the United States during a recent four-month period, there were 455 divorces. In Montana, there were 803 divorces per 1,000 new marriages. In Oregon, 768. In California, the most populous state, there were more than three divorces granted for every four new marriages, more than three out of four. And according to an article by James H. Bowman, religion writer for the Chicago Daily News, in which he quotes William Grendike, director of casework for the Catholic Family Consultation Service, people threaten divorce sometimes to get a response. Practically everyone who comes in here, says Grendike, says he or she cannot communicate. The ultimate in demanding communication, he says, is to say divorce. That will usually get attention and produce some kind of response. The main reason for the epidemic proportions of divorce in this country seem to be lack of communications. Another big factor in assuming divorce statistics is the fact that people aren't tolerating bad marriages anymore, the fact that the marriages are bad being usually their own fault notwithstanding. Many younger couples are not willing to put up with what they consider to be a bad or even mediocre marriage. The facts seem to indicate that they become bored with one another. Communications break down because both of them have said all they know to say, they've depleted their respective memory banks, and then sit in silence, reading or watching the tube. Unlike the Canada goose, humans do not tend to mate for life, at least not anymore. Another cause of divorce is rising affluence. Money is a tremendous contributor to divorce. Speaking of divorce, I agree with Mr. Hills, who in his book writes, I have nothing against divorce, God knows. It's the unhappiness that causes the divorce that I find hateful. And he suggests that what causes this unhappiness is the inability to cope, the impossibility of keeping on top of all the things that keep popping up, the sad inadequacy of our efforts to keep together in our lives and to keep our lives together. And what causes this inability to cope, this disorder, is the complexity of the way we attempt to live. Another good reason for the theme of this issue of Direct Line, which is to return to Earth to further simplify our lives, 